Good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully, everybody has had uh, a good lunch and has enjoyed the very first morning of SoccerX Europe here in Lisbon. Um, I'm delighted to be with you this afternoon as we look at a panel called The Rise of Women's Football, Making the Breakthrough. In 1992, as an 11-year-old boy, I went to my very first football match. It was Tottenham versus Everton. I was a young Spurs fan. Uh, I was standing in the East Stand at White Hart Lane, as it was then. At half-time, Tottenham had cruised to a 3-0 lead. We then let in three goals and drew three all. Some things do not change. How is this relevant to today's topic? Well, this year was very special for me. I have a four-year-old daughter. She's going to come up here on the screen now. And I had the opportunity to take her to her very first football match. In June, I took her to the Amex Stadium, the home of Brighton and Hove Albion, for England versus New Zealand, a women's football match and a warm-up for the World Cup. She was inspired. There she is, clutching her Lionesses poster, and she went home the whole way, and she did not let go of that all evening. Since then, she wants to watch, she wants to play. It was fantastic. Some things have changed. And this afternoon, I have a fantastic panel here on the stage with me, and we're going to be looking at a range of topics, including the World Cup that happened recently in France. And that's where we're going to start. We're going to look back at this Summer's World Cup, have a look at some facts and figures before we start having some reflections, and then we're going to look at a range of topics linked to the women's game. So let's have a look now at what happened this summer in France. Hello and welcome. The period of waiting is over. This is where the journey begins. Sit back and enjoy the 2019 FIFA Women's World Cup. And now, before I speak to the panel and introduce them, I'd like to introduce a special guest. We have Paolo Ferreira from Goalpoint, who's going to share with you some facts, some figures, and some analytics from this summer's World Cup. Pedro. Good afternoon. Wonderful images, Jess. I hope you all had a chance to see this World Cup. If you didn't, you missed a hell of a tournament. Uh, first of all, to allow very quickly everybody to understand who I am, I'm a founder of Goalpoint, which is a Portuguese soccer analytics company, founded five years ago, the first one in Portugal, and as far as I know, still the only one. Um, and we work with clubs in a pro level and agents using analytics to help on their activities, but we also have a side of content production and turning data into uh, meaningful storytelling and content for sponsors, media, and uh, other institutions related with the industry. Early this year, we came to meet with SoccerX and we challenged them to a mission that we believed in, which was to be the first ones to cover the Women's World Cup at the analytical level that it should uh, but not in a nerdy way, we can be nerds, but if we want to reach everybody, we shouldn't. Uh, but in an interesting way, in an accessible way, with content that everybody would understand, that the media would value, that the fans would value, that the players would understand, and using social media and all the digital channels available. SoccerX trusted in us, joined with us, and we did it. 
for the whole duration of the tournament, we covered, we made instant stats using OptiData, which I also have to thank our partner uh, for all the matches. This was infographics distributed in social media in real time as things happened. We rated the performances of players using our performance algorithm. We highlighted the best players of each match, their performance, the special things they did, where they played, where they interacted. We did special, we followed the special agenda of the World Cup every day, highlighting specific players' tournament performance so far, highlighting tops, specific tops of the hundreds of variables that we can work with, always in a visible, impactful way, as I told you, that in a way that can appeal to people that thought they didn't like numbers and data. We compared players. Sorry, the clicker is not working. Okay, we did teams of the round and team of the tournament. What you see here is our team of the tournament, which is different from the official FIFA team of the tournament. If you want to debate this with me in the end and understand why we have this team, I'm glad to explain. We elected our player of the tournament, which was Samantha Mewis, not Megan Rapinoe, although she was an icon of the tournament, but in terms of the whole production, the engine that she was in US midfield, she was our player. And this is also something useful in the work that we do, which is to find the gems and the performance highlights beyond what we as fans, our emotions and media tell us that were the most important ones. So this is what we did with SoccerX, uh, which I think was amazing because it was the first time that we did it and I think that ever, anyone did it at this level with this vis visibility and with this visual impact. But just before I finish, because Jez is counting my time, uh, did the game change? We also look deep into the data to understand how the women's game changed from 2015 World Cup and 2019. And I could stay here for two hours and you will all leave. I won't do that. I will just highlight four or five interesting topics that allow us to understand that something changed and for the better for at least something that is interesting. When we, sorry, when we started this analysis, we were scared because look at this. The number of goals was exactly the same between tournaments. And it gets even more scary than this because the number of free kick goals was also the same, three. And the number of penalty goals was also the same, 18. So we started getting scared. There wasn't a, a story. It's an interesting resemblance. And here you can find the top three top scorers of the tournament. But as we dug deeper into the data, we found other interesting data that show that evolution. First of all was that the, the teams present at the World Cup 2019 made more shots inside the box than in the previous tournament. This gave us the first indication that teams in this World Cup build up deeper in a more complex way, trying to reach the goal and taking their shots closer to the goal. Okay? The numbers you can see in green is the absolute evolution, so that means that we had plus 99 shots on target compared to the previous World Cup, which accounts for a 13.5% increase. Then we confirm this by looking at key passes to the box. Key passes are the passes that are made and that provide a shot situation. And this also increased dramatically from the previous tournament. This statistically is dramatically. It's a huge improvement. Uh, on the left side, you always see players that excelled in each of these topics. And also, the overall richness of the game increased. We had more than 1,000 actions, 1,229 actions in this tournament per 90 minutes versus the 1,115 the previous. So we had an increase of 7% of richness, richness in the game, more stuff happening in the game uh, this tournament. Most of this was pass attempts, which links up with the first topic. 
which is teams try to build up in a deeper way. The game in the World Cup was also more aerial. There were more aerial duels, more aerial cha challenges, more headed shots, more headed goals. Okay? And this is interesting because goalkeepers was a hot topic during the World Cup and when we talk the women's game, based on our pre-assumptions and most of the times about things we, haven't, we are clueless, clueless about. And the fact is that the, goal key, the goalkeepers in the WWC made more, although the total amount of saves per game persisted around f five, the amount of safe saves, which are saves that are done either keeping the ball or throwing the ball into a safe space where there's no opposition to create danger, increased significantly. And here we have one of the top examples of that. So, to finish off, and you notice that I never mentioned the men's game numbers. I'm not here to compare the men's game numbers, but this one I have to compare, especially because we are in Portugal, and people here from Portuguese football know that Portuguese games are plagued by fouls and interruptions. The World Cup at 20 fouls on average per 90 minutes. Almost less three than the past World Cup, which is an example. And if we go into deeper and check the amount of, for instance, yellow cards that women players saw by arguing with the referees and with their opponents, it's almost non-existent. So here is something that the whole football can learn from this World Cup. So, this conversation could last a lot longer. Feel free to approach me and ask me more about it, as the panelists have already done. Very nice to meet you. Uh, I would like to finish by thanking you all for your attention, especially after lunch, uh, and thanking very much SoccerX. We are very proud to have worked with SoccerX in this, to have earned their trust, not only because of what SoccerX means, but because of their history too. So thank you very much, and hope you have a very good SoccerX. Thank you, thank you, Pedro, there. And I'm sure you'll agree, a, a fascinating array of different facts and stats there that we can start to get our teeth into. Um, before we do start discussing uh, the World Cup this summer in a little bit more detail and some other different topics, I'd like to introduce our panel. Starting at the end, I'd love to introduce Laura Georges, for, um, former French international with 187 caps, including three World Cups one Olympics, uh, and now the General Secretary of the French Football Federation. Welcome, Laura, to our Thanks. panel. Uh, Marjena Bogdanovic from the English FA. She is the Head of Marketing and Commercial for the Women's Game. Welcome, Marjena. Um, and Rebecca Smith, another former international uh, for New Zealand, uh, including two World Cups, two Olympics, uh, and now you are the Good, good job title, this one, the Global Executive Director of the Women's Game at COPPA 90. Can we just give our, our panel a round of applause, please? So, so we've seen the action on the screen. We've now heard the stats. Now I think let's start to dig a little bit deeper. And Laura, I think it would be nice to start with you to kick us off. Can you give us, as the host nation, perhaps some reflections uh, as both the organising committee, as the, as the host nation, great hopes both off the pitch and on the pitch. It'd be great to hear your thoughts this yeah, afternoon. Yeah, first I would like to just say thank you for you guys to be here. I was not expecting to see all these people, to see as much people to watch and talk about women's football. So I don't know if it's because of the World Cup and you're like, we are interested in knowing more about the World Cup. But thank you. Thank you for coming because it's, I didn't expect to have as much people to attend the discussion. And to talk about this World Cup, it has been like an amazing experience for me. I got the chance to be the ambassador during the World Cup, so to promote the World Cup before the World Cup, during the World Cup, and now to be invited to talk about this World Cup. And as a player, I've always been interested during the World Cup. Okay, am I gonna play on good fields? Am I gonna have like good training camps? But when you are on the other side, this is another business. It's all about, are you gonna have people in the stadium? Or do you sell tickets? Or do you bring people to watch the game on TV? Even if it's not your national team, or do you bring and make sure that people are going to watch the World Cup? 
So this, this is all the things that I was like now taking care of. How do we make sure that people know about the World Cup and not just the people who are fans of women's football? How do we make sure that the people in the street know this is the World Cup? So we, have been, we can say that this World Cup has been amazing and incredible. First, for the fan experience, we wanted to make sure that this World Cup was going to be um, like a party for everyone, not just for the fans of football. We wanted to make sure that everyone in France was going to enjoy this competition. And the first goal that we had with the Federation was to, to go to make sure that the FIFA, to make sure that the clubs, the regions, the districts were involved in this World Cup. We, didn't, we wanted to make sure that people were going in the stadium. Because how do you go to the stadium? How do you make sure that you have the people going in the stadiums? First, we work. Sorry, I didn't do it properly. But to make sure that we have people going to the stadium, we were working to have like a good ticketing proposition, proposal. How do you make sure that a good proposal? We are OK. How do we make sure that people go to the stadium? We're like, OK, we are going to propose a package. We want to sell three tickets, like three different games. It's not just one game, because if I'm French, of course I'm going to go see France. But I want you to make sure like, you go to see China. I want you to go see Jamaica. So we work on a package. And then we say, OK, people are going to buy some package. We say, OK. And we are going to create, we say in French, the demand, the will to get the special tickets, to have the single one. So we're like, we sell the, the, the tickets by packaging the first month. And then we say, OK, but you have made now one week, and you decide to buy one, one single ticket. And it worked. People were like, OK, we need to get tickets, so let's buy the tickets. So we are, selling, we are buying three games. And then they say, yeah, but I need to see this game and this special game. What do I do? OK, you have one week to decide which single games you need to buy. And so we were creating this type of demon. Like it's a marketing organization that we did. And people were responding to this. The first day we launched the ticketing, we had 45,000 tickets sold in one day. And most of the final and the, final and the, and the semi-final tickets were sold out in one day. So that was the kind of the technique of the ticketing. But now, how do you promote it? I will talk about what we did in France to promote it. So that was a long work. It's not just one week before the World Cup. Like we were going to see the district, the region, the clubs. Because the people who want to go see the games are the clubs, the district in the first things are those people who like football. So we make sure to go to all the general assembly of the clubs to present the ticketing, uh, all the ticketing information. We are going to tournaments. I, we are going to uh, sport events in the different cities. So if I had to talk about my experience, I had 30 events in nine months. I had 72 hours in trains to, to, like, to promote all these events. But then, what we wanted to make sure that the people go to the stadium, we have to make sure that the city are promoting the World Cup. How do you make sure that the city wants to organize this World Cup? Because people will say, oh, let's go to the World Cup in France. They have nice cities. And, and a lot of people were saying, why don't you have like Marseille as the host city? Why don't you have Bordeaux? Bordeaux has like fine wine. And Bordeaux is a nice city. Why don't we have a stadium for the World Cup there? But we say, no. The whole city needs to have the will to organize this World Cup. You don't say, OK, we need Paris, we need Lyon, we need Marseille, we need the big city to organize. You have to have cities who want to organize it, but to organize it well. And I will give you the example of Valenciennes. When I got appointed uh, as a general secretary, one of my first meetings was to be the jury to decide which city is we are going to host the World Cup. And we had like. Uh, the people representing the, villa, the city of Valenciennes. So Valenciennes, do you know, who knows Valenciennes here? Just raise your hand. All right, not a lot. <laughs> so Valenciennes is a, is a city on north. When you go on vacation, you don't think about like, Valenciennes. <laughs> Valenciennes are the type of people, they work really hard. It's an industrial place. But those people like football. They are devoted to football. And when we have the mayor saying, I want to organize this World Cup, 
I want it. And we say, why? He said, because I want to bring proud to my city. I want people to, be, the people to feel that they are proud and they are, they are like willing, like they, are, they have the will to be part of something big. And so when we have this talk to the mayor, we say, okay, we give you the chance. You're going to be part of the, city, of the host city. And then Valenciennes was the city, who, the fourth city to, to welcome the most fans during the World Cup. So it seems, Laura, that a lot of the, the points that you're yeah. raising there are yeah. around success was based on number of spectators, yes. number of fans. And is that something from the outset that, as a host nation, attendances, fan base was quite a critical and yeah. quite a key marker for you yeah. as, a, as, a, as a host and as an organisation? Like to have the full stadium? Sorry, could you repeat Yeah, it? so yeah. full stadiums, yeah. attendances, was that quite a key kind of yeah, marker was for you as an organisation? that was a key. And sorry, I didn't even give you the number. When we started the competition, I said, OK, how much do we want to fill the stadium? And we're like, OK, let's strike 770,000 tickets. It will be good. At the end of the competition, we were 1,100,000 tickets sold. We had 75% of the stadium full. We had 24 games sold out among 52 games. We had 294,000 foreigners to come to the, to the game. We were expecting 77,000, but we had 294,000 foreigners. 25% of the spectators for, were foreigners. It was really impressive. So when we talk about the rise there, that's a, a significant breakthrough yes. from what you hope to, to where you actually got to in regards mm. attendances. And Marjana will talk later on about Euro 2021, but I know that the, the English FA is setting a very high bar for, for attendances. Yeah. Um, Lauren, just moving on to the pitch, and we won't, we won't chat too much today Sorry. about on-field performances, but as a host nation, obviously, um, there's always an element of pressure on the team, but obviously, with, with a country like France, a high level of expectation. Does, does, did they see it as a success, both off the pitch, obviously, but on the pitch as well? Because despite not winning, surely they must have inspired so many girls, women across the nation to, to participate in football moving forward through, through the way that they engaged with the nation. And when, you know when we have the slogan, Dare to Shine, I was like, all right, that's the slogan for the French national team. We've been losing every quarterfinals, every semifinals, <laughs> everything. I was like, Dare to Shine, it's a moment to win something. It's at home, it's nice, it's going to be... Yeah, but the, but the quarterfinals for me was like a final. Mm. We are not in the right bracket. But so it was, it was really hard. And as I say, what was important is like the sports part, we cannot yeah. work on it. It's, a, it's about the players. That's why it was important to be good at organizing this event. But it was really hard to see the national team lose at the quarterfinal because we are not qualified for the Olympics. Mm, it's hard. But, but now... It's I, I, the, yeah. the country is, is, is doing well. We have more and more like uh, and, uh, new, I guess young on, players. On, reflec on reflection mm. now, as in sitting now, mm. several months after the after the after the tournament, you reflect in a positive way, as in you were happy with the yes. way the tournament went. The number of kind of, of participation levels increased, or is it too early to say that as yet? What what's the long term impact and the legacy that that the World Cup will have in France? So for us, it's too early to say. Okay, what was the impact? But we have made, like for the moment, we have like survey who are made to know, to see the impact. <coughs> but we have a legacy. We already anticipate on the legacy. And the a legacy is like to support all the clubs who will be investing in women football, like with the structure, with the equipment. And even we want to support the coaches, the referees, and even women who are like going to be the next leaders. Because if you want to football to continue, you have to have women with position. Because women know about the game. Mm but we want them to work with men, but you have to empower them. So you have to support their education. This is what we do by supporting their education. And I must say, it was a great choice to uh, take the World Cup to Valenciennes because it was a day trip for me from the UK. Went down to watch that. Did it, I'm not sure if anybody saw the slightly controversial England versus Cameroon game, one for uh, referees and the VARs on another panel, perhaps, that one. Um, Marjena, uh, moving on to, to you. As, as a visiting country and uh, a World Cup in France is the closest we're going to get to a World Cup, you know what I mean, from England, just, just over the channel. Um, went in with expectations. Um, it would be good to hear your reflections 
um, in, in several ways, really. Firstly, as a visiting country from a football perspective, uh, and then also as, as a visitor knowing in the back of your head that you have the Euros just round the corner. Um, it would be good to hear your thoughts and reflections on the World Cup. I think in, uh, in terms of the World Cup, for us, it was really exciting. It was the same time zone. Um, the BBC were covering it. They would committed a huge amount to it. And that, for us, I think, when you see the viewing figures that we got, um, an astounding 11.8 million for the semi-final against the USA, still today is the highest viewing program of the year in, in the UK. That is just phenomenal. Um, that we still hold that record. We beat the Cricket World Cup that was sensational. Um, and they were on two channels, so we're still holding, holding that, that mantle, as it were. Um, from our perspective, it was an opportunity to test new things. Um, we did a lot more with our own fans. We, we brought over some 3,000 fans. I know the Americans went crazy, but they're used to this winning, winning, winning the World Cup, and they, they all bought packages way in advance. For us, it was doing something different for fans. We had fan hubs. We were just across the water. So. For us, it was special. It was an opportunity to really build an audience. We built that Lioness Supporters Club, so mm. we launched a lot of things to start on our journey for 2021 and beyond. This World Cup was one step on a very long journey that we're planning. This wasn't the, the, the big end discussion. This is along the way for where we're heading now, which is to do a lot, lot more in, in the UK and in England specifically. Um, is this a good time, perhaps, for yes, us to show the, uh, show the video? Um, Marjana's got a fantastic uh, recap video that uh, the English have put together. And I think we're going to pop it up on the screen now for us to watch. Phil Neville's out of word. He said, Frank Hurt. Steph Horton. Keith of Paris. Do me proud. So get behind the girls, get behind the lionesses, and be ready. There's something breaking on the horizon. A new dawn for football. No more boring. So when the whistle blows, be ready. <laughs> Get your cones out. Congratulations. <laughs> Hello guys and welcome to Lionesses Daily. <laughs> oh, you should have been waiting to say that by the way. 3-1 to England. What does it mean to be a lioness? I came to get this party jumping as it can be. I came to get the lead. Rotating! There's a breakthrough! And uh, we're looking forward to the last 16. And the Liverpool girls combine. <laughs> Um, two things I'd just like us to look at off the back of that. Firstly is around this brand of the Lionesses, which seems to have taken um, a life of its own, so to speak, in, in, in its growth. And secondly, um, something perhaps around um, 
it really felt like the whole behind the scenes element allowed and, and being in England during the World Cup allowed us to get to know the players better and in a way um, started to allow role models to be created. Was that perhaps the aim and intention? So two questions there. One about the Lionesses and one about the importance of role models that the English players would kind of become. We, we set out at the beginning of our journey um, that we had to do two things. Um, we had to build credibility in, in the players as credible players, quality sport and also as an inspiration. Those are our two key objectives. And we always look at changing perceptions, signposting, um, building a profile, and then we can get commercial value from that. And for us, that credibility and inspiration was about our campaign. We linked in with the, with the men's brand look and feel because we felt now was the right time. We'd, we'd done something different previously, and now we were aligned. We were a lot closer together, but actually we still had our own identity. We went with the Be Ready campaign because we knew something was coming. We could sense there was, there was a change in the air. And I think Bex will speak more about the importance of telling stories. And that's what we wanted to do. We, we agreed with the BBC about a documentary. That, for us, was opening our doors. Um, scary when you let the TV follow, the, follow you around and the cameras were there every day. Um, but actually, that was really valuable. And that, alongside the squad announcement, we, we talked to, to whether it was His Royal Highness Prince William, to David Beckham, um, to um, Emma Watson. Uh, the announcement of the squad suddenly woke up the nation and the world to there's something happening. And that was what we wanted to do. We wanted to just move the dial. Um, and for our, from our perspective, the World Cup was so successful, more so than we imagined. When you sit there and you look at, we're going to announce a squad and we're going to get some celebrities, not a soul was paid. Nobody was paid to do that squad announcement. We asked them, and if they were interested, we would work with them. But they had to believe in what we were trying to do, which is change the world, change the social environment that we live in. And football has the power to do that. We can't do it alone. We need our friends. And we brought in a lot of powerful friends to help us with that. And the Lionesses are now an established brand. I think we've still got a lot of work to do, but we are definitely on a journey there. Did I answer both questions? You did oh, indeed. Yeah. I yeah, think I that what's okay. interesting so far is, is when we come back to this title of making the breakthrough, passion is needed and all those trips around to all the cities and an element of risk taking. Risk yeah. taking is, is, is key if, if the breakthrough is wanted. Uh, Rebecca, thank you so much for sitting there quietly whilst Marjana and, and Laura have been <laughs> speaking. Um, so now, as an, as an ex-player, it must always be great to go back to a World Cup. Um, but in your role, obviously having previously been at FIFA, but now in your slightly different media role, um, what were your observations of the World Cup? And did you notice a significant difference in the approach, in the fans, in the play? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I just wanted to compliment the, the French Federation because, as you said, when I was working at FIFA, my role there was to work with the French Federation on the Women's World Cups. And when they first came to bid for the tournament, they said, we want this World Cup to be the best World Cup we ever hosted. They didn't say Women's World Cup. They said we want it to be the best. And what they did is they took risks. They put them in big stadiums. They chose big stadiums. I mean, they chose Parc de Prince yeah. in France. I mean, you don't get any more iconic as, of a stadium as that. And they dared to, to try to fill it. And I think um, that was very bold on their head and their, um, from their perspective. But you have to lay that found work to be bold. And I think because the French Federation came in with that mindset, it was so much easier for the BBC, for a Copa 90, for a lot of the other um, entities coming into uh, wanting to be a part of the World Cup to say this is going to be the best World Cup that's ever been. Um, and, and so I think that it really it blasted a lot of the numbers. BBC saw the best numbers. In Brazil, they saw 56 million watching their final game. Um, I mean, 88% of Denmark, I'm sorry, of, of the Netherlands, 88% of the Netherlands watched the final match. 88% of the entire population of the country was watching the final match in, in um, what country anyway, Netherlands. Um, and I think that, yeah, for us at Copa 90, our, our big um, in to, to working on the World Cup was trying to tell the stories because the sport now, the quality is incredible, so it just needed more visibility. But how are you going to follow those stories if you don't know the characters? 
Mm. So from, from our standpoint, it was a lot about similar to what J Laura was doing and, and Marzena was trying to do, was to build those stories around who these players are. So we, we did things like having an event 50 days out of the World Cup to, to create these icons. And then during the tournament, we, we just really um, tried to tell the stories through the players. And I think that that's the first step to the storytelling that we tried to do, but also make it cool. You know, I think women's football and how people perceive women's sport a lot is, well, these poor women, you know, they're always struggling and they're always trying to go against all these, uh, stories. yeah. We don't want those stories. And those exist, they yeah, definitely exist. exist and there's some really inspiring people out there but they're also just really incredible athletes. So mm. to Marzena's point her, and the credibility of the players, we wanted to show all the different aspects of, of the, the game, the sport, the players and the storytelling around it. And do you it. feel, again on reflection, you achieved that as in the response to the content you made yeah. has been good? Absolutely. Um, not, not by design, not because it was one of our KPIs. Um, our strategy was all about doing the right thing. We created uh, two clubhouses in Paris, and then we moved it to Lyon. We wanted to be a hub for fans to come, and what we got what we received as information was that there's no place for anyone to watch the women's games. There's nowhere in France that they can go and actually be in an environment that mm. supports the women's games, that, that has really cool events. And we did fashion events, we did music events, we did film festivals. So we tried to bring in a whole new type of audience through all of the different cultural touch points that if you don't like women's football, if, you, if this is your perception of the women's game or I don't know any of the players, it's okay, you can still come in, you can still watch a fashion show and then maybe stay and watch a game and get to know some of these players as well. So from, from our side, it was very, very positive. We also had Ada Hegeberg, uh, you know, pre la previous to last week when Lucy Bronze took the, the Player of the Year award, she was the best player in the world. She came to the clubhouse and she said, I've never seen anything like this, it's amazing. Um, we ended up being the number one um, publisher during the World Cup outside of rights holders and that was not our intention we weren't going for vanity numbers but we just we felt that it was cool and and the, the response we got was massive and now the commercial interest is there so we're working with big brands now like a visa like a Pepsi like a Budweiser um, to help build their storytelling and credibility so in essence what we're saying there is that the World Cup is is a slight tipping point so by taking risks people being passionate people the drive to get to this point has now tipped the balance slightly. And, and, and in a moment, we'll move on to some of those discussions. That The World Cup in the summer was a game changer, so to speak. It's, um, it, it's a tipping point that's been coming. So we've been, people who are working in it, and I think yeah, all three of us will say, we've seen this coming. Yeah. Um, but I think what's changed now is the World Cup has let everyone else see. Mm. That, yeah. that is the change. So if I look back at my presentations from about a year ago, and I talk about a tipping point, and, and a wave that we all must be on. And, and we were telling people, this is coming. Now everyone's gone, oh my God, it's here. Yeah. Um, and everyone else has woken up to it, which is great. Welcome to the party. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. So passion, risk taking and be cool. There we go, yeah. there's three things to, to take through. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna leave the World Cup now. It's like half time, we're gonna t make a few changes. Um, and we're gonna move slightly on to both the domestic game uh, and the European club competitions. And, and I thought quite apt being here in Europe, Soccer Race Europe, a good starting point um, as well to talk about the Champions League and also what's happening in the European leagues. Uh, and Marjana, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with you. Um, what has recently happened in, in England with the WSL is that they recently have got a new title sponsor for the league for the first time. Barclays is now the title sponsor. Um, and what I would like um, from you, Marjana, if that's okay, is firstly to give us some background information not on why now? How come the league now has a title sponsor? And what do you hope to come from it? Um, and how do you hope it might grow the game? I think our ambition was to, to find a new, new partner for the league. We had a supporting partner in, in BT Sport previously. Um, but actually, I think when we started speaking to Barclays, it was, it was right time. It was, it was the right environment. It was the right people and the right property. But actually, more importantly, when we first met them, it was the right purpose. They believed in what we were trying to do. And we spoke to them, and there were no contracts, no presentations, and we met with them, and we were on the same page. We wanted to make a difference, and we saw football as a vehicle to make a change. And their commitment is beyond the Barclays Women's Super League. It's also, they said, we want to do more. We want to help girls play football at grassroots, and they're committing a, a huge amount to actually supporting getting football into school. So at the moment, in the US, they play football, soccer, 
every day at school, at college. Whereas in England, it's not mandatory. You play netball or you play hockey. The boys play football. We want to change that. We want football to be a sport of choice for every girl so that they can play. And Barclays are going to help us do that. And that, for us, is a game changer. The moment that we announced that deal, I have never, ever seen, and I've been in the commercial sporting world for many years, too many, probably, um, a response to a sponsorship announcement. That's all it was. It was a sponsorship announcement. It went crazy. Even my brother, who pays no attention to what I do, or football, texted me and said, did you have something to do with this deal? So he'd heard about it. It was, it was a moment that, that changed commercial outlook on the women's game. It was the biggest deal in women's sport in England, I think possibly across Europe. I won't tell you the numbers, um, but they were pretty big numbers in terms of the value of that agreement. It comes to fruition when we open out. Um, this weekend is the, the start of the, the season. So for us, it was massive, absolutely massive. And then we went on to announce the next deal and the next one. And all I'm going to say is watch this space for more. Well, and that was going to be my next question, Marjana, not for specific names, but have you found now that perhaps, whereas it would have been you knocking on the doors, now partner sponsors are going to start knocking on both clubs, leagues, federations, future tournaments, and commercial deals can have a, a bigger impact now on the women's game? Very, very much so. The thing that, that we've changed, and there's always a topic for discussion, is, is whether it's you, you buy the men's game and you get the women's game free. That, you know, you get it, here you go, you can just have it. We've changed that and we said, no, actually, we're not going to split the rights, but actually when a partner comes to us and says, I want the men's and the women's game, then I want to see the commitment for the women's game. If you're not going to show me the commitment in, in terms of marketing, spend, and everything else, you can't have it. And then you tell me how much it's worth. So when they come, and, and the majority of our partners are now coming to us, whether it's Head & Shoulders, whether it's PayPal, whether it's Google Drive or Deliveroo, they're all saying, we want both. Because the world has changed. It's not just about the men's team anymore. And, and that's where there is a difference. Some partners will come to us just for the women's game. Which is, which is great, but actually it's important to have the right partner for the right purpose and not just a tick box. And I guess that's reflected in some of the new sponsors for the England national team, BT yeah. being the England sponsor, Absolutely. not the England men's sponsor. Yeah. Um, Laura, um, kind of your thoughts, um, sorry, Rebecca, sorry, your thoughts now, <laughs> get my name wrong here. Um, with this increase in money coming into the game, do you now feel an element of responsibility to build on this as an organisation like Copper 90, as in how, how can you increase money into the leagues, increase fan base, as in what's your kind of goals and targets now for the next 12 months, 18 months off the back of this growth? Yeah, I think um, to answer the first part of your question, football is an ecosystem. So when people say, oh, is it a tipping point? It really depends. Is it in the UK? Is it in the US? I mean, in the US, it's already past the tipping point. In places like um, South America or parts of Asia, it's very nowhere near a tipping point. So I think what we have to look at and when we look at football is as an ecosystem, you have the brands, you have the broadcasters, you have the media, you have the players, you have the federations, you have so many different elements and they all have to come together to actually get to the point where you're developing the game. So our, from our role at Copa, it's, it's you know a media partner working with brands and also strategic. So a lot of the unknowns in the women's game are there's just a lack of data. You know, if you're a brand, you, you, you're not really sure if you should get into that space because you don't know what your ROI is going to be because it's more of a startup business rather than a corporation where you can already predict what's coming back to you. So it's a more long-term investment, I think. So what we try to do is create more data around that. So we work with Man City, for example, their women's team, because they wanted to understand who's our audience. We don't know who our fans are. We don't know what they think about our women's team. Do we put the women on the same platform as the men? So we did a deep dive to try to understand who are those fans, what do they want? And out of the back of that, we created the, the One City, um, One Passion, where they put both of the teams on the same platform. So if you go to the Man City Instagram right now, you'll see the men, you'll see the women, you can separate it as well. But that puts it on the same platform. And what that shows is that women's football is football. And that's what we've always believed at Copa 90. So what we're trying to do is work with different types of partners like clubs, like federations, um, like players themselves to help build their brands, um, and definitely brands as well, because they don't really, a lot of them, they make an investment like a Barclays, and maybe they're better assessed to be able to do that because they have the hand-holding of the FA, but a lot of brands really don't know how to get into that space. Mm -hmm. What are the stories that we tell that we don't trip up? And to be honest, it can be kind of scary. I mean. Even Phil Neville had a couple tweets that were, ooh, I'm not so sure. And, and it wasn't because, you know, 
anything to do with him or his personality. It's just a space where you, ha you need some help sometimes mm. to, to tell the right story in the right way um, that, that's going to be empowering and not detrimental to the sport. Uh, and just from an observation, as in this time of the year is always pre-season with all the kit launches, the number of kit launches where clubs launched the kit with both male players, female players. Mm. And that was, a, that, uh, that was an observation you know what I mean? And that, that was a, a big change. I know that definitely in the UK and I'm sure globally. Nike launched in Paris yeah. um, at an amazing, amazing event mm. in Paris mm. dedicated to all of the teams that they were sponsoring with specific kit, dedicated kit for the women's teams. And, and it was like a fashion show. Mm. Never before had they done that. The players loved it. The fans loved it. Yeah. And the social and media interest of that event yeah. was huge. Massive. Wasn't it? And for me, it just makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, yes. if you're a Nike and you're already investing in all of these these uh, uniforms, why would you not make it a massive event? Mm. But but they just don't really think like yeah. that. And, and so for us, also at Copa90, it's about, well, just bring more visibility to the reasons why actually it just makes sense from a business standpoint as well. One, one interesting point you made there was the fact that um, although the growth is happening in certain countries, you've observed as, a, as more of a global um, uh, organization that that growth isn't happening anywhere. Um, does it concern all of you, if you take off your national federation hats for a moment, that perhaps growth in some countries will be accelerated and in other countries it will be kind of left behind and there might kind of essentially be a big disparity between those nations that are succeeding on a domestic and an international level and perhaps those countries that aren't? I don't know. I, th I think you'll certainly, we're working with UEFA on a number of projects that will help other countries that aren't as well equipped as we are. And we're sharing the resources and the information that we have. So I know that certainly UEFA are doing that with us. Um, I can't speak for FIFA because not as close to them as we are with UEFA. Um, and I think that is important that we take the other countries on a journey with us and we'll yeah. be sitting down with the French. What did yeah. you learn from the World Cup? Because we need to know because we've got the Euros coming. And, and there's no harm in sharing. Mm. Absolutely wouldn't share performance um, data, but we should share what we learn from events because my territory and what I do, actually, if it works in France, do it, make it bigger. Because the more the sport grows worldwide, the better it is for all of us. Yeah. And it's true that like, the development of football, as you see, is dependent on the quality of the governance. We're not gonna lie. Why do always Europeans are finalists and why African teams are always like down? That they have like good players, good quality players, but their, their governance is not good. And as you see, there's Fatma Samoura to take care of the business because there's corruption. And if you have not good governance, you're not gonna have like a good structure, good directors to take care of what is important. So your youth and the, the grassroots. And so it's true that us federation, we are lucky to have pretty good governance, not because I'm in the position, yeah. <laughs> but thanks to the FIFA, we are going to support some African teams, some mm. teams in the West Indies, and from there, so we're like, we need to share the experience and to support each other, but it's true that the governance is making a difference, and the leaders are making a difference in the growth of the women's football, or the sexy foot, how we say, or the different type of football, depending of who leads the country. I also think if you look at like the two sports you have, men's football is quite saturated now. I mean, the, the broadcast rights and everyone competing and lots of sponsors trying to get into that space. In the women, so it's a big pie and everyone's trying to get a slice of it. In the women's game, it feels like it's, again, like a startup business where everyone is trying to grow the game. So it feels a lot more like a cooperative spirit and people trying to help each other to all grow the game because everyone will then benefit after, which is another reason why having the FA player like the OTT, where they're showing every single game free, live to air is something that will grow an audience that will then become commercially viable which is fantastic I think because I guess that coming back to the title the, the rise of women's football it's the rise of global women's football and I think it's important that lessons from countries that are both successful on the pitch off the pitch those, those lessons are learned globally and I guess that's where an organization like Copa 90 can share those good news stories globally um, one thing I didn't mention at the beginning when I was uh, sharing the successes of our two former players, sorry, Mar Jenner on this one, um, is, the, uh, is, is, runner, is, is down to the, uh, down to, uh, the Champions League uh, wins and performances of both um, Laura and Rebecca. And, and the Champions League is something that I just wanted to finish on and come to you, Laura. Um, I was wondering if I could get your thoughts um, 
on the dominance in recent years of French teams in European competitions, primarily thinking about uh, Lyon uh, and what they've done to become such a force, um, attracting some of the best players, and sorry again, Margena, um, that includes some of the best WSL players that have recently made, made the transfer to the French League. What can you put that down to? Why, why the dominance? What are they perhaps doing differently at those clubs that has allowed their growth? As I say, what makes the difference is the leader. And the person who is taking care of, of Lyon is Jean-Michel Oulas. And someone came to him one day and said, okay, this is the plan, President. We have this team, women's team, the FC Lyon, but we are not gonna go further if we don't have the money. So he studied the plan and said, okay, I'm going. But he didn't go just say, okay, I'm the president, I got the women's team and it's gonna be fine, take care of it. He's involved in the team. Of course he has money. And he said, okay, maybe I cannot afford it with the men. Sorry, it's a caricature, but maybe I can afford to be Barcelona of Madrid, but I'm gonna do the best team ever. I'm gonna bring the best. I'm gonna put the money in it. I'm gonna bring the best players. But it's not just money. You have like good facilities. You have doctors. You have cars, and it make a difference. We were considered as pro. I got the chance to play six years in Lyon. We were like pro. We were like considered like pro. And saying like the president was involved, if we had like a problem, we could reach the president. One day I got injured before the semi-finals of the Champions League. I got injured in the national team the, the same night. Jean-Michel Olas called me. I'm like, what? He said, Laura, I know you're injured. Tomorrow you're going to see the surgeon the president of the, of the club is calling me to say, tomorrow we are taking care of you. I need you for this semi-final. The president is taking this step. And I have so many examples. Let's say, for example, he was on TV on Sunday talking about the men's game, and the journalist said to him, so president, what are you gonna do after, the, after this interview? Say, I'm going to see the girls. And right after we were at the game, a lot of people were coming because they saw him on, on the interview. He was spreading the word. And at the same time in the club, we had like a special show for the girls. We call it Drôle de Dame. So Drôle de Dame is kind of the spe special, one, special woman, 007 woman. And we have a show dedicated to the players. And, as, and it was like seen by the people of the region, even sometime from the people from France. And I remember I had my interview and one of my teammates told everyone I was called Foufou or Santa Maria or something. And so I was warming up during the, the game and someone called me Foufou. I was like, are you serious? <laughs> because they were watching the show. We got to know each other thanks to this show because there's like an atmosphere. We were considered as pro professional players and that make a difference. This so, is why th I think players go to Lyon. So in regards, obviously, there's a leader, there's a pioneer there. When you talk about training facilities, are they equal between men and women? Yeah. Do they train at the same facility? They train in the same facilities. We were playing in... Uh, the, so they, we train in the same facilities, and the big games were in the main stadiums. Champions League were in the same stadiums. And we were like... when We were invited to see the games of the men. We were introduced to the players. We have events with the players. And, and yes. your knowledge of, um, obviously, other French teams and German teams and, and, the, and the American League and, and in the WSL, is this something now that other teams are starting to copy? And uh, I try to stay away from that phrase of level playing field or, or equality between the teams. Is that something now that more club owners are doing and realising that that's not only their responsibility but the right thing to do? I, th I think we've seen a... A big change. Um, probably the most recent one is Spurs, um, knowing you're a Spurs fan. <laughs> so previous to this season, they've just come up from the championship up into the Barclays Super League. Um, and they were run by a group of almost volunteers, the women's team. But they now have been embraced by the main club. I don't call it a men's club. It's a main club. It's a main stadium. Um, and that's the difference. That, you know, I think when they're embraced as part of the bigger, the bigger club, I think that's when they do well. And, and yes, it's still going to take time until they are commercially self-sufficient. And we're working with a lot of clubs mm. to try and help them. But actually, there's nothing wrong with being part of a bigger club and then sharing resources. And, and more are doing it. But in, in my opinion, there's still a lot more that can be done. A lot, lot more. It was interesting. I saw, um, I'm not sure if any of you saw Liverpool Football Club's summer pre-season tour to the USA was Liverpool Football Club. Yeah. It was the men's team, it was the women's team. Jurgen Klopp was sitting on the, on, on the private jet with Vicky Jepsen, the Liverpool manager. 
and they did everything together. They went to the same cities, they trained at the same facilities, and they called it the women's team was playing on match day one, the men's team was playing on match day two. And that's a significant change. That's a breakthrough moment. I also have seen, you know, growing up in the States, when I started playing 15 years ago, I think the, the clubs that succeeded the quickest and the most successfully were the clubs that linked with the men's um, and did it from a one club sort of standpoint. When I was playing, started playing in Germany, it was FFC Frankfurt and Potsdam. Has anybody ever heard of either of those teams? Okay, cool, we got one. <laughs> but you've heard of Wolfsburg and you've heard of the men's clubs and now the Wolfsburgs have taken over all of those clubs. Um, same in the English Premier League, I mean in, in the women's league. The league didn't really exist when I was playing and then all of a sudden the Liverpool started coming and, and the, these other teams that were linking to the men's. And because of the name of the club, players started going there because they had this brand awareness globally and I think that's exactly what Olympic Lyon did and, and I think that that's why the NWSL and the US struggles still because mm -hmm. they don't have a link to the MLS, they're not using the synergies from the men's club and yet they still struggle commercially to become entities that are sustainable um, in and of themselves. So, so still a way to go then in certain leagues. Um, no. Just conscious of our time, um, just want to finish with you, Marjena. There's a big red now flashing number in my face at the bottom here. Marjena, um, we are now on the road to the next major tournament. Um, I was lucky enough to work on the bid with Marjena for the Women's European Championships, UEFA, in 2021 in England. Um, thoughts, update? Excited, good progress, countdown is on. Um, the countdown is definitely on. We've announced um, the nine cities where we'll be playing. We're spreading it as much around the country as we can. We want to welcome all the European nations. Um, and we've got a big ask. We want to sell 700,000 tickets for a European championship. Holland had 250,000, so we've gone big. We're putting the final at Wembley. We've committed that. Um, whether England are there or not, we want England there, and that is our performance ambition, is England is going to be in the final. Um, it's, it's going to be a game changer for, for the UK. 2012, the London Olympic Games changed the face of Paralympics in, in England and worldwide. We think the, the Europeans in, in the Euros in 2021 will change the face of women's sport in the UK. It will be the highest and largest and biggest event for women's sport the UK has ever seen. What a good way to finish. Uh, so on behalf of all of us here at Soccer Race and behalf of uh, my little girl, Sienna, because I'm very excited of the, of the continued rise of women's football and I'm very excited for the game that she's going to grow up into. So Laura, Marjena, Rebecca, thank you so much indeed for your time. Pedro, are you still there? There you are. Thank you so much indeed for your insight. Um, making the breakthrough, the rise of women's football, um, a fascinating look back at this summer's World Cup and interesting discussions on the continued rise and growth of women's football. Um, unfortunately, we haven't got any time for, for floor questions. If you would like to speak uh, to the team, uh, they will be open for kind of either informal questions out on the floor, although these two, this end are flying back not too far. You've got to be quick. Uh, and I know there's a few press requests that have already come in. Uh, please go and see David and his team if you'd like to speak to them officially. Um, but could we give all our panelists, please, a big round of applause. Thank you very much for your time, everybody.